Hello to all our poultry keeping friends out there. Good to see everyone tonight. Nice to be here with you. And joining me tonight is Karen Johnson and Alyssa Wash. Walt, sorry about that. Okay. Um, and Jeff, for some unknown reason, has decided to, to take off and go fishing, but he deserves a little break every now and then, as long as he doesn't make a habit out of it. So, no, it, that's, I hope he has a, a good time, a good, enjoyable time. You know, I hope y'all have been having a great day. We we were just discussing and commiserating before the show started how some things today have been less than successful. <laughs> but uh, I, I know it's been miserably hot for many of you, and it's, it's tough on the birds, and it's tough on you. So you have our sympathies because we know what you're dealing with. Tonight, we're going to be talking about conditioning your birds for a show and it may not be exactly like what you're thinking hey, Karen's getting it over there like a possum eating cheese tonight <laughs> <laughs> so I think she has something in the store for us so Karen yeah what no. what do you have in the store for us tonight nothing we're, nothing we're gonna talk about all the questions people ask you but I did. I wanted to clar clarify what we're going to discuss tonight. So, All right. um, go ahead, Alyssa. There you go. You have to read it, Alyssa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Um, so Rip, what do you use to wash your birds prior to a show? That's a really good question that we're not going to answer tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's because we're going to be talking about conditioning and not grooming. And conditioning is, when it comes right down to it, it's sort of a lifelong process of a bird. Where grooming is the last minute primping and spiffing and, and all that you go through getting your birds ready just before the show starts. But conditioning starts, really, to me, it starts before the hatching egg is even laid. And it goes back to all the things that you need to do to get your breeders ready to produce hatching eggs. You know, you want to make sure they're on a good sound nutritional diet. You want to make sure they're free of parasites, plenty of space, all, all those basic sort of things. And I, I looked up the definition of conditioning in the APA standard. And it says conditioning is a state of the fowl in regards to health, vigor, and and those associated things. So it's more about the physical properties of a bird than it, than it is about the appearances that we, that we tweak and try to build on in the grooming process. Now, we're gonna be talking about grooming in, in much more detail uh, on our next show, which comes up in two weeks, but we'll, we'll get into more of that later. But just remember this, Conditioning is basically all the things you do to get a, a bird matured and ready to show. Grooming is all the other stuff, the washing, uh, trimming nails, trimming beaks. Don't answer of our fall. questions. We're going to go through that list now. Oh, okay. <laughs> we um, <laughs> before, we, before we do, uh, Shaggy, is that any better? I tried to raise Rip's microphone up. So if you can tell us if that sounds any better to you. Um, let us know. Um, but all right. Yeah. So I do want to go through when you just are reading articles and seeing like when you're writing down a list of things you need to do before you go to a show. Um, these are most some of the ones that come up. So we're going to go through right now and figure out whether those are grooming or whether they're conditioning. And then therefore, you'll know whether we're going to talk about it tonight. So, <laughs> All right. And Rip, I think you touched on this first one a couple of times, but nail trimming, where would you categorize that? That's a, a thing that can really fall into both. Um, you want to keep the nails short. If you let them grow too long, then the quick gets long. And then when you try to come back, cut them back, the bird bleeds a lot and you don't want that. So I got into a habit where I kept uh, toenail clippers on a string around my neck every time I was out in the poultry yard and when I was handling the birds, I was always checking beaks and toenails. And if they were starting to get a little long, I'd just take just a few seconds and just snip them back off. 
So idea. could be either or. Yeah. That's a great idea. I just have it that handy. All right. How about cage training? Cage training. That to me is more in the grooming end of it than huh. it is in the conditioning. Um, and I wrote an article just about, oh, I don't know, 10 days, two weeks ago on coop training birds. So if they have a question about that, they can go back into the group and, and uh, search for that article on coop training and it should pop right up because it, it's not been that long ago. Okay. Then what about spur maintenance? Spur maintenance. Spur maintenance is not really a big deal with cockerels. So really it becomes more of a grooming type thing to me. Uh, particularly with old cock birds and, and when they get really old, they can get really long spurs. Uh, and, and those may need to be addressed either by uh, removing them or cutting them back or rounding them off with a Dremel tool, something of that nature. So spur maintenance is really more about grooming to me than it is about conditioning. It's how you keep your females looking okay too. That's right. And not wide open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rip. So adding ID to my birds, where does that fall under for you? Well, to me, it falls under just chick ID. You know, I, I would band my birds as soon as I took them out of the hatcher. So it's, it's over and done with, and you don't have to worry about it later on. Now, do birds have to be banded to be in a show? No, they really don't. Now, some county fairs and state fairs do require it, but they will typically also supply the bands if it's if it's a requirement of that show. But for most open shows, it's not a requirement at all. Okay, gotcha. All right, then you mentioned this, the beak maintenance. Mm -hmm. And I think you said that that was, does that go under both again? It could, but I, I tend to think of it more as a grooming thing when I'm getting ready for a show. Not only do I want to clip the beak back if it's too long, if you just clip it back, you wind up with two little sharp points on the front. So mm -hmm. take a fingernail file and just kind of round it off or smooth it off. But I, I think of that more as a grooming thing as I do a conditioning thing. Okay. So as someone who has never um, shown a bird before, how do they handle the, the nail file to the beak? Nope. That's next show. <laughs> Sorry, okay, dang. All right, I'm gonna. I'm the gonna police has down. spoken write it, here. Write it down. <laughs> Wait, you are keeping us on track. Thank That's you, Karen. Right. <laughs> All right. So then, posing training. Which one is posing training? Posing training or coop training? Mm -hmm. Teaching a bird how to stand. Um, that's a grooming thing and not a conditioning thing. See, we're not gonna talk about anything. Dang. I have to disappoint you just as much as everybody else. Oh, uh, we're getting to the good stuff. <laughs> All right. Parasite control. What does that fall under? That falls under conditioning because uh, I think everybody will agree. If you have birds that have a parasite load, whether it's internal or external, that can affect the health and the vigor of your bird. So that's a conditioning thing. Okay. Found one. Mm. Vaccinations. Vaccinations. If people choose to vaccinate, I know some do, some don't. Uh, but I would, because it's a health related concern, I would put that under conditioning. Okay. Can I ask a question about this one then? Sure. So do you have to have your birds vaccinated to go to a show? No. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say no. Some states do require it for some diseases. Okay. And so, there are some vaccinations you're not allowed to have, right? Right. Uh, really? check, check with your, well, I shouldn't say your, but check with the Department of Ag in the state where you're going to be showing to find out if they have any vaccination requirements. Okay. All right. Improving feather condition. What does that fall under? That is a conditioning thing. And, and really... Improving feather conditioning is as much about genetics as it is about growing birds, but we're going to get into some of the things that you can do uh, specifically nutritionally uh, to improve your feather condition. We'll get into that in a little bit. Okay. All right. 
So what about preparing the transport cages? That is a grooming thing. And, and I'm, I'm getting my cart ahead of my horse here and I don't like to transport birds in cages because cages are typically constructed out of wire and wire is terrible on feather conditioning. Uh, it will tear up tails so fast. It's not even funny, but we'll, we'll get into that next time when we talk about. Okay. I have so many grooming. questions about that too. <laughs> See, right. no, now you can't miss. I know, I can't wait. You, you, should, you should probably tell people that that's our next show. We haven't actually announced that. So. Well, I think I did the very first thing. Oh, you okay, were there asleep. You <laughs> All right. All right. What about making my birds shiny? Um, this is where Rip can admit he doesn't really know what that means, but it seems to be what everybody's after. I need to make my birds shiny. <laughs> <laughs> there are some products that are used and they consider that as a, uh, a grooming component. Okay. Uh, I don't recommend those products. The, and one I'm going to tell you right up front, a lot of folks call it pink spray and it's a, a human hair care product and it will shine your birds. No doubt about it. It will also make them very slick. I have nearly dropped birds, uh, at shows before. And it not only when you're spraying it on the birds, they tend to stand right outside their coop and hose those birds. They figure if a little bit's good, a whole lot's a whole lot better. And, and I've almost fallen myself because it gets on that concrete floor and it, it's slick as oil. Mm, uh, the downside of that is that it will also, uh, if you put just a little bit too much, it will attract dust and it makes your birds look very dull in color and not shiny. So lay off the pink stuff, y'all. Mm -hmm. Bad stuff. All right. We got two more. What about plumping up or thinning down my bird? What is that under? That would come under conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that, that you know, and we've talked about weighing our birds and why we need to weigh our birds. And this is just another reason. You, you want your birds to fall within a certain weight range. Uh, you don't want them too fat. And you certainly don't want them too skinny. There's nothing I hate worse when I'm judging the show is to pick up a bird that looks really good from the outside and to find out it's a whole lot of fluff and not much stuff. Mm. In other words, there's a lot of feathers hiding a very small body. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a real disappointment. So weigh your birds. Okay. Conditioning. All right. This one got my attention. What about covering the white and the feathers with a Sharpie? Mmm. So that's the secret question. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to have some little smart alley. When do you do this? I, I, I was going to say, since you, you put it on my list as a secret question, I was going to give you the secret answer because if I told you, then you would know. But I won't. <laughs> that is called faking. F-A-K-I-N-G. And that is a huge no-no. You cannot do anything to alter the appearance of the bird. You can't add colors. You can't uh, pull feathers at the last minute. Um, not only will that get that bird qualified or disqualified, excuse me. Uh, if you have 20 birds entered in a show, all 20 birds will be disqualified. The judge will disqualify your entire entry if he find you guilty of faking. So you're disqualified, not just that individual bird. That, that every bird you brought is disqualified. You're out. Not worth it, folks. <laughs> and, no no and, matter where, if you do it months ahead of time or right before. And then <laughs> back to the original question about adding color with a Sharpie, it's easy, easy, easy uh, to find that because you can smell it before you even pick the birds up. Hmm. Doesn't it rub off on your hands? Not usually, no. Okay. There used to be a product that some folks tried to use to put yellow color on the legs where it wasn't yellow before. It was called, it was a, uh, it was a Purina health care product called Puramycin. Okay. And it, it would make nice yellow legs about the color of the yellow on our background here. But uh, it would also come off on your hands if you weren't careful. So okay. hmm. that was pretty easy to smut too. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the last of the either or questions. Are you ready? All right. I know. Now we'll get down to the good stuff. Yes. Top 10. Top 10 questions for Rip now. About Are you ready for number one, Rip? Lay it on me. 
All right. Intended. So how far in advance do I start getting my birds ready for the show? Well, like I said, very early on to me, conditioning starts before the egg is laid. Make sure your breeders are healthy. Make sure they are fed a really good quality feed. Uh, make sure you're using the best possible management practices. Give them plenty of space to grow and mature in. Um, I like to, if I'm showing, got a group of birds I'm raising to show, they'll probably get three or four times the amount of space that it calls for in the, the manuals. Um, just because I don't want any fussing and fighting and squabbling, but it's everything you do getting those birds up to the point of maturity. Okay. That's all. So just everything. Everything. <laughs> it's exactly right. Anything and everything you can. So that's what you're teaching us tonight, how to do everything. Uh, well, in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> but what all it comes right. down to is just paying attention to detail and, and yes. trying to be a good manager. Yes. The, the best exhibitors I have ever known paid incredible attention to detail. Okay. All right. Question number two. Mm -hmm. Is having my birds in good condition for a show really all that important? It sounds like so much work. It is a lot of work, but showing a bird in general is a lot of work. Raising a bird, whether you're going to show it or not, is a lot of work. Um, but is it important? Yes. Because when judging a show, judges look for three things in this order. They look for type first, color second, and condition third. So the overall condition of the bird, believe it or not, that accounts for 10% of the total score if you were to score a bird out using um, the scoring method. So yes, it's very important. So type, uh, color, and condition. Yep. Can I don't. Yep. Go on, Karen. Sorry. This isn't on our questions, but it's my question. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of a bird that's out of condition. Like, what mm -hmm. would you knock off points off for? Uh, that's a good question. The feathers are rough, raggedy looking. Uh, the bird is noticeably underweight. It may not be far enough underweight to be disqualified but it feels light in your hands the body the muscling is just not there um, it's overly fat uh, <laughs> hiding there karen <laughs> i can't hide my birds so i'm just hiding myself yeah. <laughs> but those those are the things anything you know basically anything that detracts from health and vigor Mm -hmm. So is that where, like, if they have started to molt or if they, yes. if they've lost a point on their comb to their neighbor as a kid or, or you know what I mean? Or frostbite like, or any, any okay. those are the little things that can make or break a show bird. Mm -hmm. um, and you're talking about little things making a difference. I, re I remember a show I was clerking for, um, Gosh, Bill Holland, I think. Uh, and there were two black old English females and the judges were pulling their hair out trying to figure out which one they liked. And what it came down to, believe it or not, something so small as the second place bird had a small grayish white streak on the middle toenail on the right foot. <laughs> the other bird had nice black toenails. But that one little black or grayish white stripe caused that bird best to breed. And ultimately, the, the one who won wound up being show champion as well. And that's what Craig is saying that, you know, it's if you're at a good show, there are lots of good birds in the show. So it's the yes. little things that set them apart. Yes. And you can spot those birds if you're going down, and, and Craig knows this. I can go into a show and I can walk the show. And I can spot the birds that are in really good condition. Uh, they, they just stick out like a diamond. All right, Rip. So if I want to show my birds in three weeks, they feel, feel thin. What can I do? Pray. 
Uh, uh, there's there's no quick fixes for mm. adding on weight or taking off weight. Um, it all boils down to good nutrition from day one as a chick until the last day they draw breath on this earth. Um, and I'm going to make a comment and I'll listen that I'm going to turn it over to you, but where a lot of folks go awry is they will pay attention like a laser focus to the amount of protein in the food in the birds diet, but they kind of don't pay attention or just sometimes I think they flat ignore the level of amino acids. And I think that's because they don't understand the importance of amino acids and what they can do for our birds. Could, could you explain that for our, our viewers? Yeah, you bring up a really great point, Rip. Um, so first of all, nutrition is fundamental. And then if we break nutrition down into like protein, protein's super important. But when you look at a feed tag that like 20% crude protein, um, when you look at that, all of that showing is or, mm, crude protein is very crude in its explanation. It does not tell you if that's a good quality feed based on the protein. So your protein source is only as good as your amino acid profile. And amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So there are, um, and then amino acids get broken down into essential, conditional, and then non-essential. So the ones that we're going to, we focus on, or I focus on as nutritionists and, and Jeff does as well, are the essential amino acids. Um, mostly methionine, lysine, and threonine. So methionine is really important for growth and development and protein synthesis, as is lysine and threonine. Um, methionine is also pretty important for feather development. If you ever notice chickens eating feathers off the ground, so not just picking them up or plucking at them and messing with them, but actually eating them, that's a sign of a methionine deficiency. And that's because methionine or feathers are made up of mostly methionine. What was that third one you said? Threonine. Spell that. T. Oh Lord. Uh, Give me something close. Let Just me get pretend. a pen. Oh, T H R E O N I N E. I think. Yep. Yeah. T H R E O N I N E. Methionine, lysine, and threonine. So, and when you look at a feed tag, oftentimes they're going to have crude protein. None of these are spelled right. We're just, we're just getting all, that close. Yeah. All of them aren't spelled correctly. Um, <laughs> Keep going. I'm just <laughs> trying to. Uh, so methionine, or oftentimes feed tags will have, they're definitely going to have the crude protein on there and they should have fat and fiber. Sometimes you'll see methionine and lysine levels on there. Those are good numbers to look for. And this made me think of the um, the post earlier today. Rip, you commented on it as well. Yes. Um, and it was a 20% crude protein layer feed. And I remember that the lysine levels were 0.6%. Right. 0.6% so lysine is low, especially for a layer feed. Um, so, and especially, and if we're looking at a 20% protein layer feed, we want those lysine levels closer to one and the methionine levels closer to 0 0.35, 0 0.4, um, a little bit. So yeah, a little bit higher. And you're not always going to see those levels on the feed tag, but if you're curious and you give your feed mill a call and ask them, they should be able to give it to you. And if they can't or they won't, there might be a reason why. Yeah. And Alyssa, I want to kind of loop back to something uh, you said earlier and really stress it. Mm -hmm. uh, folks, remember what she said about methionine and lysine. If you want good fleshing on your bird, you got to have the proper levels of methionine. If you want good feathers on your bird, again, methionine, lysine, or what you want. These are the things that you need to be aware of if you're going to have those, quote unquote, nice shiny birds at the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's not something that you can say, okay, well, I got a show coming up in two or three weeks. I need to up the levels of methionine and lysine. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. No, unfortunately, I wish it was that quick to, to make a nutritional fix. That, it takes that time. would be nice. And even like for your chicks or your growing pullets, um, if you don't have adequate, you, if you don't have a good quality protein, you're gonna your growth is gonna 
be slowed down. I think is how I want to say that. One thing, and, and I know you see it too, Alyssa, um, that I've been seeing a lot lately is um, when it comes to the feed, actual ingredients in the feed, mm -hmm. I see a lot of plant protein products mm -hmm. or protein byproducts. Mm -hmm. That yeah. doesn't really tell me anything. I want to see, is it corn? Is it soybean? You know, what are they feeding? To me, products and byproducts, especially byproducts, have already been used for something one time and they got all the goodie out of it. Mm -hmm. And and now they're trying to tell me it's good for my chickens to eat. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to buy that. I agree with you on the feed tags if they keep the wording really vague. So like they can use collective terms. And so instead of listing them out, like you said, like having corn, soybean meal, fish meal, things like that listed, they can make it vague. So they can say um, grain products, plant protein products, animal products. Um, and part of the reason that the feed mill will do that is so that they can change the commodities used. Oh, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, and it helps with price, but also my, a look, I think transparency goes a long way. Well, so it, it helps with price and, and for the average chicken owner, that's probably all well and good, mm -hmm. but I don't consider myself or any of you guys or, or any of our audience or our, our group members listening. Y'all are not average chicken folks. <laughs> you, you are the discerning people in this hobby. Um, you need to know these things so you can make the best decision possible when you're raising your birds. If you don't know, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. you know? well, and can you imagine you're, you're, you know, you work hard to get the right formula to put into your bird. And if they're just going to change it because rice holes are cheaper than mm -hmm. something else mm -hmm. this rice week, holes, then, yeah. then you, you know, you don't have any control whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yep. And I, I kind of got carried away, but that's the older I have become and the more I have looked into it, the more I have understood that nutrition is at the root of a lot of things that we come up against as poultry keepers. Good nutrition will take our birds, I think, just as far as good breeding. You know, good nutrition will bring out the best breeding you can put into your birds. It will make it visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Nutrition um, is fundamental. Off my soapbox now. Yeah, I'm so, I love that soapbox. <laughs> it can't fix genetics, but it sure can disguise them if you right. don't have it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's go ahead and just put up Mandolin's comment question here, Alyssa. Do you have any idea how often cellulose is used as a filler, which is by products from cotton and such? In terms of like poultry feed? I would assume I, so. But. Um, I mean, I... You so only work for the good places. Cellulose, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> cellulose is essentially like fiber. Okay. Um, so I don't... That's okay. I don't, I don't know how to answer that question okay. because are they going to use things like um, soybean hulls, cottonseed hulls, and poultry feed? Probably not very often because chickens can only handle so much fiber and it doesn't really add anything to the feed. Um, if you're seeing cottonseed hulls in there, I would send me the tag and I'll look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Here's how I want to answer that. Uh, yeah. Alyssa, I, one of my dear friends and, and of course, Buddy Day has been, he's passed on probably 30 years ago, but he was from Georgia. So he was a big mm -hmm. cotton proponent and he would go down and buy uh, cotton seed that had not been delinted. Mm -hmm. and grind that up and feed to his birds. I never really understood his thought processes, but it's just something, but he always did, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of course he always fed them a lot of cayenne pepper because he felt like that made them nice and red in color. But <laughs> yeah. So they use a lot of cotton seed in the dairy, like conventional yeah. dairy as well. So it's a good source of fiber. I think it's a decent protein source. And it's also got good fat in it too. So maybe it, were his birds really shiny? Actually, they were. 
It could have been the fat from those cottonseed holes. Yeah. Or cottonseed. He always had You have to go back birds. 30 years ago and apologize to him for doubting him. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I can almost tell you what he would say, but this is mixed company. Yeah. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Keep it clean. Yeah. That's pretty funny. All right. So what if my birds are too fat? How can I make them lose weight? Can I exercise them? <laughs> Run them around. You know, I don't leave. know if I've ever heard anybody exercising their birds. <laughs> no? Uh, again, it, it goes back to are they're too thin and they want to make them bigger. Now we're too fat and we want to make them smaller. But there's no quick fixes to that. What if I just I give suppose, them half the amount of food? I, I can. I suppose you could try that, but the danger of that when you start cutting back on the food is you do run the risk of causing your birds to go into a molt just before a show, and that is not a good thing. Well, you don't want them blowing feathers right and left. They'll weigh less. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any feathers. You can just like run them around for a little bit and help them lose weight every day. Okay. So I this have is all about the treadmill. I'm about people. making them naked, and you're saying it's not able to be done because <laughs> you're the actual judge, and we are just uh, <laughs> playing it's around. It's hard to judge color when it ain't got no feathers. Now come oh, on. <laughs> so that's so. What you're saying is instead of faking color, you can just throw them into a mold and just tell people they were gorgeous. Yeah, not gonna win either way. Oh, okay. All right. Just checking. So oh no quick fixes. Oh. So speaking of feathers. What if all the feathers aren't in? What can I do to speed up their feather growth? This kind of goes back to what stage is the feather growth at? You know, and it may be something as simple. Just give them a little more time. Um, I'm going to jump ahead in my notes here, but one of the things that I learned almost by accident was learning how to time the hatch. Uh, I had heard on numerous occasions that a pullet is in her best show condition the day she lays her first egg. Hmm. And I had never, I guess I just didn't let it register, but I had four Rhode Island red pullets in a show three of which laid their first egg there at the show and they placed first, second, and third. The first place pullet also wound up being the show champion. Just casually. Just, just casually. casually. Just, just, she just also happened to be the best time, bird you know. in the show that whole time. I was <laughs> doing my happy dance all over that show home. Um, I think that was my first show champion, by the way. But and when I mean time in your hatch, how long does it take your birds to fully mature? You know, now with my red pullets, I could get them matured in a, between six and seven months. So if six I seven. wanted them at the peak of condition, I, if I was had a show in July, I hatched it in early January. Okay. Males, on the other hand, I could never get a male red to mature in less than 11 months. So I had to back up 11 months to hatch males for that show in July. So it's learning how to time your hatch. Learning yeah, don't go to a show in July. You'll have to hatch in August. <laughs> a terrible time to hatch. Well, <laughs> interesting enough, uh, one of my old mentors said, if you want birds in good condition to show, hatch chicks every other month. So, so that's not too far time that. through the show. Um, calendar. But then I, the next question I get asked when I make that statement is, how do I tell when my birds are mature? And I tried to find a graphic to illustrate this, and I could not. But chicks go through three different sets of feathers before they mature. Uh, the first two sets are or juvenile feathers and the the wing feathers have very pointed tips very sharp pointed tips once they molt all of those out and grow in that final mature set of feathers 
they are very rounded on the ends of the feather. And once you open up a bird's wing and you see all nicely rounded primary and secondary feathers, that bird is mature. And that's also the best time to cull them for color as well. That happens before they start laying though. Like that last. Mm, with my reds, not, not really. Cause it was taking them a good six months or excuse me, six months or so um, to really mature. And they, by then they were laying. I'll need to make a note. I've got young <laughs> birds all a week apart. Let's see when that happens. <laughs> Well, see, you got the perfect opportunity to do, uh, to track that data. Mm. Let us know what you find. Oh, sure. On next, <laughs> I will let you know what which time each of the groups did it. You just have to listen to the data prayers. You got right. it. <laughs> All right. So, is there anything that I can feed just before the show to make the feathers have a good sheen? No, there's really not. Um, if you go back to feeding a good feed with the proper levels of methionine and lysine and threonine, that's going to make your genetics of that bird really shine their best, no pun intended. But it, it's, um, you, again, it's, there's no quick fixes for things like that. And people have tried for decades to come up with something that worked. Um, Shoshin is something you can spray on. I, I saw uh, Craig mentioned that he likes to spray it on a cloth and rub it on there. If you want to build up a nice shine on your birds, go down to the Dollar General store and get you some El Cheapo silk uh, cloths, handkerchiefs or, or whatever. And you can rub your birds with that silk cloth. You're going with the lay of the feathers from head back down towards the tail. And you can build up an incredible shine on your birds just doing that a few times a day. Interesting. So does it stimulate like oil production in their feathers? Why does it do that? You know, I really don't know. I don't think you'd be stimulating oil production. I think it's like um, polishing a wood desk. Mm -hmm. Um you don't even have to have any polish on your cloth, but if you, you go back and forth on that wood, you can make it shine just a little bit better than it would normally on its own. Okay. So I grew up riding horses and one of the trainers I worked with, when people would ask him how his horses were so shiny, I mean, yes, dye goes into it, but he said a good curry comb. So just brushing them regularly. Yes. yes. Ooh. I'm glad I don't have to brush my chickens. I had enough <laughs> brushing at work. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So if I pulled out a damaged or discolored feather, how long does that take to regrow it? Um, again, it's going to depend on the breed and sometimes the sex. Um, but you want to allow at least 90 days. Mm. If you have a wing feather that has a Rhode Island red that has a little small white tip on the feather. You can pull that out and chances are it will come back in perfectly normal, but to allow it to be fully grown, you want to, you want to have about that 90 day time frame. And honestly, what I would suggest you do is to take a bird, you know, you're not going to show pluck a feather and see how long it takes to grow back. Trial and yeah. You're trying to see. Yeah. Well, and surely which feather it is would make a difference. You pluck their main tail feather. The surely that's going to take longer to. No. No. Nope. About the same. Hmm. Tail feathers and that. wing feathers are about the same. Okay. Body feathers may be a little bit less, uh, although uh, discolored body feathers, you can pluck barred rocks, for example. They will have. Uh, nicely barred feathers, but every now and then you'll see a solid black feather and the exhibitors will go in and pluck those out. You you could never see that they were plucked. So you said sex was related to feather growth. Do males or females regrow feathers quicker? In, in my birds, I think the males were a little bit faster maturing feather-wise than the okay. females. Um, hey, Craig, go ahead. I was going to ask Karen what she was going to say. 
Yeah, we're both caught in the comments. I'm enjoying Mandolin's <laughs> response there. As a former hairstylist, rubbing the feathers with silk essentially refreshes the oil that's already there and gives a more even application of what the birds already put on from their there we go. screening gland. Doesn't that sound great? Yeah, that does. That's awesome. Like, Works for me. That's I'm right. using that mandolin. <laughs> you have said it in a way that makes us all wholeheartedly believe. Yeah, um, definitely. And then Craig to talk. Craig wants to talk grooming. Rip, you should get Craig to talk grooming with us. So yeah, we need to do that. Craig, pay attention. Washing <laughs> a bird before the show early enough for the bird to preen itself helps with the shine a lot. Yes. Um. All right. I. I, I feathers okay and this is almost a breeding thing as much as it is how do you know when your feathers are raggedy because of genetics or condition like you had overcrowding or usually like, if it's a genetics thing they will come in looking raggedy like from the beginning like all the sets of juvenile like feathers. frayed and that kind of stuff and it's usually because the little barbs and hooks on the feathers are damaged somehow as they grow or they just don't exist. That's that's why silky feathers look silky. They have no barbs and hooks to hold on to each other. Yeah. Um, but they can start looking raggedy, right? If you, you talked about giving them twice as much space for a show chicken as you would. I do that just because of trying to avoid squabbles and feather picking as much as possible. Okay. Not that I've ever overcrowded my birds, but. <laughs> especially, especially with the males. Males, um, I, I just always gave them more space than I did females. Just because of the, the incidence of squabbles that can break out. All right. Oh, do we have any more questions on that? I still want to talk feathers. Are there okay, <laughs> because you let me come back? Okay. So I'm just going through all the things you hear, right? So mm -hmm. do feathers really fade in the sun? Do yellow birds do white birds turn yellow? Do <laughs> you can't you can't change that at the last minute, can you? I mean, no. that's something you need to plan for. And uh, <clears throat> some colors do fade in the sun. Buff is bad about fading. Uh, blues are bad about fading. Um, whites, if they turn yellow, and this is getting into grooming and not, um, but I'm going to go there anyway. But if you have a white bird that has yellow, uh, particularly males have yellow hackles and saddles, there's nothing you can do until that bird molts to change it. That's called brassiness. And that's, that's a pretty severe fault. Um, it, that's just something you have to live with until the, the bird moves out again. So, but the conditioning part of that is that if you know you're going to show that bird, would you try to keep it out of intense direct sunlight? I mean, absolutely. I, I tried raising uh, buff coaching largefowl when I was first getting started and uh, buff uh, Plymouth rocks. I loved them. They're still my favorite color of poultry today. But in this Florida sunshine down here, you could let them get into almost any amount of sun and they were instantly overexposed. Uh, the color would got splotchy looking and very uneven blues the same way. And to do the, to raise them right there in the South, you, you just about got to keep them in full shade. Lloyd, Craig, or Craig, Lloyd, would you like to come? Uh, try that again. <laughs> Craig Lloyd would like you to come onto the show. So Rip's going to have to make that happen. I don't know how, but uh, all right, putting that off. All right. So I had no idea that it was this complicated to condition a bird. And See? it's too late in the season for the, for this. It's too and late. We haven't even gotten <laughs> to the grooming part. And that's when it really gets complicated. Oh man, that's tough. A lot of time goes into it. So then what should I do now to prepare for the next season's shows? I'm going to go back to that timing the hatch. And there is a video in our archives on that 
called Shape to Show. Uh, but take a look at that, and that will help you. If you know, usually most folks who are, who are planning shows later on in the year, they already have that planned out because they have to arrange for, for time off and somebody to take care of their, their other animals while they're gone, and, and it takes a lot of timing that goes into that. Um, and if, if you know that and you know you're planning on going to a show, Ohio National in November, well, I've busted my window for this year uh, because I can't have birds ready if I start, excuse me, start hatching now. But I can if I know I'm going to go back in 2023, I can time my hatch to take advantage of that. So each breed, you're going to have to know your breed, right? Know when they hit. Yep. Know you when have they to, have rounded wing feathers. You, you have to learn. And and that's, you know, that's just like showing horses or anything else. They're, they have a, a window where they peak in condition. They know, um, probably horses were not the best example because I think it's easier to keep a horse and show shape than it is a chicken. Um, but... So these next questions, I'm pretty, I think these are really good questions. I'm excited about them. Um, so can we go to those? Yeah. Go for All it. Right. All right. So how long will my birds stay in top show condition then? You know, it's funny, Craig Hanson and I were talking about this the other day. And again, some of it's going to be breed dependent, mm -hmm. sex dependent. Uh, and Craig said his males seem to stay in show condition condition longer than his females. I found that to be true with my reds as well. Um, you know, I may only get one or maybe two shows out of a bird that's in good condition before she's out of condition again. So then what, it's like having to start it all over again. What were the three things that you looked for? You had mentioned those earlier as a dredge. Thing. Oh, the top three things type mm -hmm. color okay and condition gotcha so those three things only peak for maybe two shows when 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 you get everything to line up just right you know mm -hmm. how i said earlier you could spot those birds yep. because they stuck out like diamonds mm -hmm. they don't stay that way forever <laughs> right either your uh your your type's going to get messed up with molding and feather loss and that kind of stuff. Um, the color may be uh, one of those colors that are sensitive to sunlight. It may be uh, a color that has a tendency, uh, blue, for example, will sometimes get a brown cast to it if they get too much sunlight. And, and it's just a fact of raising blues um, and those sorts of things. It is a, um, you know, and we've talked about it before. The, the good exhibitors playing pay incredible attention to detail, um, and there's a lot of details that you, uh, over time, you get to noticing these things without even having to think about it. Uh, but it 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 takes a while. There, there's a learning curve there. There's no doubt about it. But it sure yeah, is fun. Right. All right. So then. What age do you want them to be for a show? We're going to keep asking you to give us the answers we want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's, I, I can't give you a, a definite answer. Uh, young birds, you want them mature and falling within the allowed weight. Um, you know, we talked about you can tell maturity basically by the, the shapes of the primary and the secondary feather tips. Um, Older they bird, start laying eggs. Yeah. yeah. Older, your, your cocks and your hens, that's, that can be a little more dicey. Now, and something Karen and I were talking about earlier today is that some folks think the bird or the judge won't notice if they take a very young cock bird and show him as a cockerel. Now, remember, cockerel is less than a year old. A cockbird is more than a year old or 12 months, either way you want to look at it. 
that is one of the easiest things in the world to spot and to check for. Wow. Um, and I do it every time I handle a class of males and nobody ever knows what I'm doing. Oh, so it's a secret. The spur. Yeah. If you take your thumb, place it on the end of a bird spur and try to wiggle it. If it does not wiggle, that's a cock bird. If you get a wiggle, it's a cockerel. Because that spur is not at that point uh, in cockerels, it hasn't attached itself to the bone in the leg. You said you wanted your males to be 11 months. You don't have much time to get in under that one month window mm -mm. before you're over a year. Mm -mm. Yeah. But so, but you're 13 month old or you're 12 month in three weeks at the next show, he still got a good chance in the, now he's officially in the cock section. And he's I, the youngest one there. So is that an advantage? Not usually. And, and I say that because birds will undergo uh, a transition between <clears throat> 12 and 24 months of age. They will change a lot. Um, So you, you kind of weigh it and take everything into consideration. Craig makes a good point here. Show your best birds while they are in condition. What can win this year may never be in winning condition again. That was, I was going to ask that question is, can you show, is it common for people to show the same bird multiple years or is it? I have done that. I, I have had, uh, Old red hens, and I know I had one. I was eight years old, and I was still showing her. Oh wow! As, as long as she was in condition. Mm -hmm. And does I would think that breed and size would matter a little bit more with that. The last show I was at, there was an eight-year-old silky that won the silky thing every year. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like in the mm -hmm. best of breed. Do you know what I mean? And like, and some of that and. I hope we do a show real soon on managing the molt. But if if you take advantage of managing the molt to help manage the weight of your birds, that will make a huge, huge difference, not only in the way your birds look, not only how, how well conditioned they look at or look in, but also it will help with your fertility and your hatchability. So that's that's my commercial for when we ever do that show. We we talk a lot about or people talk a lot about really managing your breed. Like if you have one or two breeds or one or two or three varieties, but not crazy, not although some great show people have tons of different breeds in there. Um, but do people tend to specialize in like, oh, I'm aiming for the hen class, like that's where my birds shine, or I only show cockerels, or I only show pullets, or like some people have male lines, what they call a male line. They produce better males than they do females. And then some folks have what they call a female line, where they produce better females uh, than males. So, yeah, that, that does happen. I feel like when I'm, and I'm, I have to be, I'm guilty when I'm at the shows of mostly looking at um, the large fowl, but I just feel like there's so many pullets and cockerels and very few hens and cocks shown at the, now I haven't been to Ohio. I haven't been to the biggest shows. And, and I understand what you're saying. And that's a shame. Um, when I was coming up and when I was really heavily into showing, if I entered the show, I didn't take one or two birds. I took five cockerels, five pullets, five hens, and five cockbirds. Mm. And if they had trios, I would oftentimes take at least two or three trios. And if I, if I could put together five, I would take five trios. Because when you see somebody that's doing that and they're winning, that's the person you want to go to to get your birds because they have incredible consistency. That sounds like I'm tooting my own horn. I'm not. Uh, but 
those people who win consistently are doing it because they have birds that are consistent. They've got a deep bench. They don't yeah. have a, they don't Very have a bench. one or two. Ooh, surprise. Look how awesome this bird is. That, and they that's can't the duplicate reason it. at a show today, if they have display classes, that's a cock, hen, cockle, and a pullet, and three of any other sex. You find a person that's winning the best display in your breed, you want to really look at their birds because they're consistent. I need to find a show that even has that category. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to travel for that, I think. Um, it's easier to find displays than it is uh, trios. Um, trios were a very common thing it shows and they kind of died out and um it started back in the 80s it became a little more popular okay i think we're running out of gas here people so if you've got any more questions or wisdom you want to share or just to make fun of rip or i for any reason don't make fun of Alyssa; she doesn't like it um yeah. but, <laughs> but we do have one more let's see so um this was Shelby says, I think conditioning plays a huge role on feathers. For example, keeping a bird inside all the time versus a more natural environment, have plenty of space outside and eating bugs and grass. So can't do all of those, right? If you have. Yeah, yeah it's showing chickens. There's going to be some trade-offs. Okay. Um, you can keep them in show shape. If you keep them up and inside, but then you get trade-offs like the face starts going pale on you and they look almost anemic sometimes uh, so yeah there's trade-offs you do but, hear it's not it's not i'm not saying it every but you do hear the anecdotes of oh i just went out to my yard picked up a bird threw him in the show and he won everything like i'm assuming that's unusual or that that's not usually the way it goes that you can't yeah it's not usually the way it goes I have done I I have done that one time. It was at a very small show. Okay, so you're popular. talking more state fairs. You're talking more local shows. Not no, this was an open show, but it was it was a small. I think they only had like six or seven hundred birds in the show. Only. Yeah, I feel like that's a big number. Yeah. Or is it not? No, big numbers. Ohio, when there's twelve thousand. That's a lot. Mm. We're not. I'm not starting there. <laughs> I I do hope that if even if you're not interested in showing birds on a regular basis, I do hope even if you don't take any birds, you owe it to yourself to go to the Ohio National in Columbus. It is a sight to behold. It's it's um, an experience you should have at least once in your life. When is it? Um, I think it's about the second weekend in November. I'd have to look at it, but it's it, it's in November. Okay. I think that's true because I believe it usually falls over a semi-holiday for us at the kennel. I think Veterans Day is tends to hit around that time. So yeah. Um do do the birds shed all their wing feathers every yearly moat? Yes. And if I had one that didn't, I would pluck it. Because that way that you always had fresh looking feathers. I, I I admitted this on the on Facebook the other day that I actually prevented my birds from molting one year by by saying, Oh, let me just keep the lights even so I don't have to ramp them back up. And I the I I waited a decent chunk of time, but I think I did it in early September and I stopped some of my two of my best layers that were still laying, stopped them from even molting that year, and they did not thank me for it. So they looked awful for a long time and probably just got fatter and fatter. So, <laughs> but, so don't do that. Don't prevent the molt. So. Okay. Yeah. We got any, any other questions or anything else? I think we're good. All right. Hey folks, don't forget. And uh, we kind of beat around the bush of this whole <laughs> grooming thing tonight. Uh, but we're going to get into it in detail. Grooming your birds or scrub a dub dub. There's a chicken in my tub. <laughs> Uh, Hopefully not your actual bed, that, though, in case hey. <laughs> uh, that will be two weeks from tonight, on June the 24th. 
28. And, and we're going to make Jeff do a chicken bath live since he wasn't here. Ooh. We can tell him that we mm, that could get ugly. promised no. that he'll do that. So, But uh, we, we hope you enjoyed the show tonight. We hope you'll be with us in two weeks. But until next time, by golly, keep smiling, keep enjoying your birds, and keep helping each other. So long. See you later. Thank you, everybody. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation by Poultry Keepers 360. All rights are reserved. This production has been made possible in part through the generous support of the Fur Trail Company, manufacturers of gardening and livestock products that are better naturally.